I think that's incredibly powerful for our kids to hear us being willing to verbalize those cries of our heart and soul in this particular area and, and being able to acknowledge, you know, God, I, I don't know what to do about this. Like, I don't know what to do about this continuing injustice that's happening against black and brown bodies or naming those realities. Like just being able to do that so that your, your kids can see the sincerity of your own journey. I think that is incredibly, incredibly powerful. Hi friends, I'm Amy Julia Becker, and this is Love is Stronger Than Fear, a podcast about pursuing hope and healing in the midst of personal pain and social division. Today, I'm here with Helen Lee, an editor at InterVarsity Press and co-author of a new book called The Race Wise Family. I was really grateful for this conversation, and especially for me personally, I was grateful for Helen's description of the practice of lament and why it matters for all of us to learn how to lament as individuals, as families, and as communities. And we also got to talk about why talking about race is important and how we can do this well and how we can do it with and for our children. So I hope you, like I, will find some practical ways to become a race-wise family as you listen to this conversation today. Well, I am sitting here today on Zoom with my friend <laughs> Helen Lee, who is the co-author of the recently released book that so many people who are listening to this podcast are going to be interested in. This book is called The Race Wise Family, 10 Postures to Becoming Households of Healing and Hope. Helen, welcome. Thank you, Amy Julia. It's such an honor to be with you today. I really appreciate it. Well, I have to tell you, I was ready to end this podcast for the summer, mm. and I'm going to do that soon. But <laughs> then your book came out, and I was like, oh, I can't pass this up. I've been mm. waiting for this book for like two years since I think wow. I first learned that you uh, – I mean, at the time, I don't know if you, I knew you were co-authoring with Michelle Reyes, but mm. I just knew the title of the book, and I knew yeah. you, and I knew that I wanted to read it uh, because I know that you have been living out and thinking through – all mm. sorts of issues related to race and ethnicity and family and faith. Mm. And you've been doing that for a long time. So I'm just really grateful for parents like me who get to learn mm. from your wisdom and your experiences. So I thought maybe as we start today with people, listeners who aren't familiar with your story, can you talk about how your own experiences, your own background uh, led you into writing The Race Wise Family? Yes, sure. I'll try. I'll try to do that succinctly. <laughs> but when I think of my own journey of faith, I look back, particularly in college, when I was involved in InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, and that college ministry had a huge impact on me. But the pivotal moment, even amidst that journey, was when I met a group of Asian American staff workers who were the first people that articulated for me that your faith and your ethnicity are two parts of your identity that can go hand in hand. I had been in this mindset at that point in time where I kind of wanted to reject my ethnicity identity. I had, had had enough struggles with feeling like I didn't fit in as a Korean American. I felt a little bit ostracized because of my identity. I had been teased and bullied many times as a kid because of the fact that I was Korean. So I grew up not wanting really to have much to do with my ethnic identity. Mm -hmm. And so it was incredibly healing to meet people who helped me see that God's intention to create me as I am, as someone with Korean ethnic heritage, um, living in the United States, but but fully 100% Korean by blood, was not a mistake, wasn't an accident, it wasn't a curse, which is kind of what I thought growing up for many, many years, even through college. Mm. So that was an incredibly healing, healing message. And as I started to really embrace that concept, and then start to communicate that out to other students. And I actually stayed at Williams College, where I went to school for a couple of years on staff with InterVarsity, leading an Asian American small mm -hmm. group that I had started. That experience of seeing how God was using that message of like reconciling one's ethnic identity and racial background with their faith, that turned into an incredibly evangelistic message, actually, for a mm -hmm. lot of people, a lot of students that I got a chance to work with and serve and get to know over time who had never heard 
hmm. that message before. And similarly, similarly, for many of them, they had grown up like me, like in contexts where they either were one of the few people of color or one of the only Asian Americans or whatever it might be. But that same feeling of tension inside of wanting to kind of reject their own ethnic heritage. So I was glad that I had a chance to learn that message myself. I was grateful and and um, very glad also to pass that on. And so that's kind of the origin in some ways. That, that goes back decades, right? But that's yeah. probably for me the beginning of my journey of understanding um, issues of ethnic identity and one's heritage and culture. Um, and of course, we all have a culture, right? It's not just people of, of color. We all have some sort of ethnic heritage. And so as I continue to move on in my life and professional work, just trying to make sure that I had opportunities to articulate that Sometimes we, especially if we are from like a majority culture or a dominant culture, we might, might not be aware of our own kind of cultural heritage and ethnic heritage and how important that is in our own identity. Um, so I feel like that's kind of the lens I bring to this conversation is someone who, at least for the last three decades, has really um, learned so much about how understanding one's ethnic heritage, understanding one's cultural background, how much that can deepen and enrich in your faith journey. And I, that kind of intersects with all the things that uh, get mentioned in this book to try to de- communicate that to other families. Yeah. So thank you. I really love hearing that. And I'm curious for you, the, the, that introduction leads me to two questions. One is to ask how you have, with all that in mind, raised your sons differently. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. It, it, Because presumably there was something about both the faith context in which you were raised and perhaps also the family context and obviously just the wider American culture, Mm. uh, essentially saying you should assimilate, which is Mm. to become like the majority rather than embrace and celebrate your distinctive ethnic heritage and what that might actually be as an American, what you might bring Mm -hmm. to the table, so to speak. But I'm just curious whether there are intentional ways, and I know in some ways this is what your book is about, but nevertheless, like if you can think of some ways as a mother um, and as a person of faith that you've been like, okay, so we're going to do this differently. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when I grew up, so I'm, a, I'm the daughter of immigrants. So I'm second generation. My parents were the first generation to come over from Korea. And then I was born here in the US. And interestingly, when I was younger, I spoke Korean first, apparently. But then when I got into preschool, my parents were actually told by a teacher, of course, times are different now. And the way we think about languages and how babies and children um, can internalize language. But what my parents were told at the time was, you need to stop speaking Korean to your daughter, you need to make sure she stops speaking Korean to you, because then she will not be able to stick with us and learn English and be on pace with her peers. And so of course, my parents at that point were like, okay, you know, no, you don't have to speak Korean anymore. We're going to definitely let you speak English. And so that's kind of one marker of how I was raised as a kid to yeah. almost in the very, very beginning, like when I was a preschooler, to start kind of separating myself from my own ethnic heritage. And then my parents, as you know, being immigrants and busy and just literally trying to survive, you know, day to day, year to year, we didn't have conversations, never had explicit conversations about my own Koreanness. Mm. And if anything, what I absorbed as a kid, it was my eyes that looked um, almost like critically at my own culture. There were things about it that bothered me. There were things about it that frustrated me. A little bit of what I would call kind of the Confucian influence in Korean culture, which led to some paternalistic or patriarchal kinds of cultural markers, which I didn't want to be a part of my life, things like that. Um, We had a kind of a very traditional Korean household where my mom did all the housework, she did all the cooking, and my dad, his job was to go to work and then come home, eat dinner, then sit on the, <laughs> sit on the couch and watch his favorite television show. Yeah. <laughs> so I was just feeling like, you know, I, I, that's not kind of something I want for myself. So the big joke in our household was that I was, I was never going to marry someone Korean. I wanted to really separate myself from anything Korean. And my parents didn't, maybe they didn't have the language. Of course, they, they wanted me to appreciate my culture, but I just don't, don't think it was on their radar to articulate that, talk about it, communicate about it. So I grew up not having conversations really about yeah. my ethnic identity being a gift. 
So that's one thing that we changed pretty, you know, right from the beginning. I ended up, God's humor, I ended up marrying someone who was Korean. I married, I married someone who was Korean Canadian. So, so I didn't marry a Korean American. I married a Korean Canadian. <laughs> I, I still managed it. <laughs> I did. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we, from the very beginning, were speaking to our kids in Korean. I'm not fully fluent. My husband is more, um, more fluent in language than I am, but we did kind of the opposite of what that teacher had told my parents, where he would speak to our our oldest son and uh, when he was born exclusively in Korean for two years, and I spoke to him in English, and that's my most natural yeah. natural language. Um, but yeah, from the beginning, we just wove in um, communication about our culture, appreciation about our culture, just delighting and celebrating in it right from the very beginning. There's all kinds of Korean traditions that go along with having kids and celebrating particular milestones when they're 100 days old, for example. There's a big party that, you, that usually Korean families will give to their children, because back in the day, it wasn't always the case that children would make it a hundred days. It was thought that if you could, if your child could live a hundred days, that gave him or her more chance of success in life. So many Korean Americans fa- families now have kind of adopted that particular tradition. So you'll see these hundred day like pictures and parties and celebrations, one year old, all these different kind of markers are moments you celebrate in Korean culture that I didn't experience as a kid, but that we started doing, you know, with our own family and just even articulating that um, explicitly over and over. And I do think repetition is helpful because it's not the kind of thing that, you know, and you know how it is raising kids, you've got to tell them thousands of times sometimes, and it still doesn't always get through, at least in, you know, when they're kids, hopefully they'll remember at some point in time when they grow up. But uh, yeah, we, we try to make it a very consistent thing to talk openly and freely about our ethnic heritage and how it's a gift. Now, there are things about are in the heritage that, of course, you know, there are pros and cons to everyone's mm-hmm. cultural backgrounds, so naming that, understanding it, um, talking about it, owning the, those things that can be challenging or harmful, as well as the blessing of, of the way that our culture has shaped us. Like n- are noticing all those things and being willing to talk about it. That's a big thing that we try to do in our family. And hopefully we've been able to impart that idea in the book. I'm curious also within all of this, like how... So you are certainly raising your sons and have kind of reimagined, not imagined, but re-understood mm-hmm. yourself as a Korean American mm-hmm. and not as someone who's trying to leave that Korean behind and simply mm-hmm. be an American, whatever that means. But I'm curious also, though, in this new posture of, mm-hmm. as you said, celebrating heritage and going back and saying, we have traditions and we have food and we have you know, ways of being, we have a language, um, all of this matters. How about the American part of that? Like, what does it mean for you? And how are you teaching your sons about being Korean Americans? You know, that that, that both mm-hmm. and. Um, because I know yeah. that it's really, un- like, I, I've been thinking about this as mm-hmm. someone who is called white, right? Because mm-hmm. my skin color and my ethnic heritage, which is a mishmash of European nations Mm -hmm. way back like 400 years ago right Mm. so I'm one of those people who doesn't always know what it means to be Mm -hmm. have an ethnic identity and I um and how to pass that along to our children Mm. my husband actually his dad is a Danish immigrant so it's a little bit easier with our kids to actually pass along Mm. something that feels distinctive and yeah my family's been in Connecticut and Massachusetts for yeah. You know, 400 years. And so, again, yeah. there's a lot of things that are pretty distinctive about the Northeast that we can pass on. Yeah. Anyway, I'm just thinking about the fact that it would be, like, erroneous and um, wrong and more than just a this error way to say that you and your sons are not as fully American as my mm. children and I are. And yet, because of the ethnic backgrounds that are different, we also would kind of claim being an American, I think, Mm -hmm. in somewhat of a different way. So I'm curious Mm -hmm. how you think about that, because it's not the melting pot where we've all become the same, right? And yet Mm -hmm. there is also a sense of like, but we're both Americans. Like, let's not, let's not pretend otherwise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a cool, what a great question. So it's interesting because my kids are Korean American Canadian, right? right? So they have Canadian citizenship as well. So it it often comes up in the context of the fact that we have 
we have the ease. Uh, it's a unique situation, but that kind of ease of comparing and contrasting American culture and Canadian culture. So that gives us kind of a, a framework and a base to have those conversations. And I understand not everybody has that has that framework or that base, but it gives us something to kind of work with in terms of articulating what is American culture. Because I think for most of us, it's just the water we swim in. It's the air we breathe. And so it's not even something that's easy to like point to or identify because it just surrounds us all the time. Um, so I think there there is something about as we continue to get to know just the range of people's stories around us and see how they think about identifying American culture versus Korean culture versus Canadian culture, etc. It starts to sharpen our own awareness and our understanding of the fact that, oh, this this water that I swim in is 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 not what everybody swims in. This <laughs> air that I breathe is not what everyone breathes. And, breathes, and in fact, different ones of us in this water um, swim in it a different way, or maybe we're wearing different equipment, or maybe there there's something different about our swimsuit that allows us to have a slightly different experience in that water. Yeah. Um, so even giving language to that, even just by just naming that one basic fact, which I think escapes. Particularly, I think those who grow up in the dominant culture, um, it's it's easy to think, oh, just everybody has had kind of the same experience. Everyone has been swimming in the same water. So we, we're all Americans. So we all kind of experience that the same way. But I think being able to name that, you know what, that our experience of growing up here in America may actually be very, very different, you know, from, from someone else. So even that question of trying to name what is an American culture is a little tricky because it could be very different the way I experienced it from the way you experienced it or someone else experienced it. Um, there are, of course, you know, things I think that times when this is going to sound almost really silly, but I, I think that times when we do things like watching the Olympics together, for example, is a time when you can kind of have some of those interesting conversations. And I think families love to watch the Olympics. It's one yeah. of those great moments of of getting a chance to see lots of different examples of uh, of national pride, so to speak, and and kind of even you know celebrate. Um, what it means to to be an American and how that's distinct and different. Um, but you can even have some of those conversations and commentaries about, oh, okay, so you see all these different nations. And interestingly, when you look at the delegates from the United States of America, they don't all look the same. There is a diversity there. Why is that? And mm -hmm. this is part of the strength of American right. culture is the fact that we do have that wonderful, mm -hmm. um, amazing range of people from all over. And that's not to say that other nations don't have that at all. But there is something unique about the American right. context that is different. Um, but th those are some things that you can start naming as parents with your kids when they're very young, which, again, helps them to clue into these these big kind of ideas of culture and ethnicity and identity identity with something like tangible and, and visual that they are seeing, they are noticing, but they may not understand what it means to be, say, in like the majority culture versus being someone who's a person of color and what that those distinctions even mean. Talking right. about it gives permission to be asking those questions and having those conversations. Um, so that's, I think, an important door to open even when they're young, because this question about what does it mean to be an American is complicated. <laughs> it is complicated, but at least naming that there is such a thing as American culture and there is such a thing as like dominant culture within American culture mm -hmm. starts to open up so, some of those doors of conversation. Yeah, and I think so much of your book is really about opening up those doors in both literally, as you were just talking about, that naming and noticing mm -hmm. without judgment, without right. you know, simply noticing, you know, this looks different than that or tastes yeah. different than that or whatever it is. But then also bringing some understanding of, what, again, what's the history of those distinctions, how do different mm -hmm. people experience them, all of that is going to grow both compassion and I think perhaps the possibility of celebration yeah. uh, of both and, and and of lament. I mean, I guess actually mm. maybe we'll go there. That's another mm. aspect of your book that I thought was really important that you write about, you know, 10 postures and we're not going to have time mm -hmm. to talk about all of them, but one of them yeah. is a posture of, of lament. And yeah. you write about how easily lament can be um, overlooked or mm. ignored or just not even known, honestly, in especially families that have positions of privilege within our culture. That's 
certainly true for me within our family Mm -hmm. where I feel like we've lived with economic stability and relative social ease and prosperity. Mm -hmm. Um, And so could you speak to people like me in terms of what lament is and why it's important from a, yeah, why it's important and then also what that Mm -hmm. might look like uh, to incorporate lament into a household? Yeah. So lament is one of those words that that people might want to try to avoid. It sounds sad. I mean, it sounds like something that why would you want to lament? And yet if you read if you read even especially through the Bible and through the Psalms in particular, you see so many biblical examples mm-hmm. of lament. Yeah. And I I think that the the key thing about lament and why it's important for us as Christians and as families to engage in that practice and posture is it just softens our heart. It opens us up to become more compassionate to the stories of people around us. And one of the stories, I think I told the story in the book, I don't remember, but I remember that um, I was in, uh, I was in an inner, I've mentioned intervarsity before, but I was in an intervarsity staff gathering. It was a multi-ethnic staff gathering. And it was right, I think after the, right after the verdict uh, of the Eric Garner murder had come out. So I was in this room. We were, we, we, uh, with all the other staff people, maybe a, a couple of hundred staff people of all different ethnic backgrounds. And we decided for that evening to be an evening of, of lament, mm-hmm. um, based on the verdict. So the worship team just led with very kind of soft and quiet meditative music. And then it was quiet. And then we were just invited to pray, um, in whatever way God was moving us to pray. And as I sat there in the silence of the room initially, I was sitting surrounded by African American staff colleagues. That's I just happened to be in a, in a in a particular place in the room. Right around me, all the people who were around me were all uh, fellow Black staff men and women. And one after another, I just started hearing them sob. Like one person after another person after another person just started sobbing, and not not even like gentle tears. I mean, heart wrenching deeply, deeply guttural sobs, mm-hmm. like coming from the depths of their soul. And of course, I, as someone of Korean descent, a person who's Asian American here in the U.S., I do not have the same experience as my Black brothers and sisters. Um, so I cannot fully understand you know, all the pain that happens every single time we have yet another instance of police brutality and a lost life, a senselessly lost Black life in particular. But as I was just sitting in the midst of all the tears and all the sadness and all the anger and all it, some of these tears turned and sobs turned to screams and they turned to wails and they just turned to, you know, why God, why God, why God? I mean, very, very just yelling at the top of people's lungs that they just needed to get the weight of their, of their just sadness, suffering, all of it just out. I mean, that... That did something to me in a way that I cannot fully explain. Something, of course, I knew in my head how hard these verdicts were. Of course, I I felt deeply the injustices of those moments. But something about being alongside the lamentations of mm. my black brothers and sisters as they were as they were in those moments of lamentation. Just, I mean it. I mean, it just broke me it, in a way that I don't think any other like words or understanding could have. So that's what lament can do. It can move you at a heart level mm. to really start resonating with the injustices and pains and mm. sufferings and evils of the world um, in a way that your head sometimes can't quite get there. Um, and our head knowledge is important. We, like, we need to read, we need to study, we need to learn, we need to engage our minds. But lamentation engages your heart. And I think that when it comes to this conversation about race, there's a lot of opinions <laughs> in, the, in the church. There are a lot of opinions and a lot of people who think this way about this or think this way about that. And we don't all agree, um, which is fine in the sense that, you know, somehow God will bring all that uh, to, to fruition in his unified way at the end. But um, when it's hard sometimes to maybe convince people, whether fellow believers or just other people in your circles about some of these issues, but lament it kind of breaks through mm-hmm. all of the head knowledge and all of the maybe resistance to this idea or that idea. And it just helps you, helps open you up to the heart of God and to the heart of others who are, 
who are suffering um, in a way that I think changes changes minds faster than anything else. But lament is a really important practice, and it's something that we avoid as Americans. You're talking about American culture. We are talking right. about the Olympics. I mean, usually in those kinds of settings, it's all about celebrating the greatness right. of America. Um, we don't often take the time to lament some of the harder parts of our history, the darker parts of our history. And that's part of our journey of transformation is being willing to be open to seeing the truth, both the good of who we are as Americans and also the hard hard parts of our history that we have to, and I think are still reckoning with. That's an important part of this process of becoming a, a whole and reconciled people. Yeah, and I'd love to pick up from there in terms of so much controversy we're seeing across the United States in general, but especially within the white evangelical church when it comes to uh, the idea of race as a, not just a controversial topic, but a divisive one. And one that I think Mm. um, there are parents who are, again, people of faith who fear that talking about race and especially talking about the racialized incidents of violence and brutality and systemic injustice that we you know, see regularly in the news that um, to talk about that with their children um, and in church is like signing on to a secular agenda mm-hmm. or I mean, I've seen kind of that's my the, what I see more recently. I feel like when I was growing up within kind of white evangelicalism, it mm-hmm. felt more like race is peripheral to the gospel. So it mm-hmm. wasn't like, oh, no, don't talk about that. That's secular and dangerous. It was more just like, that's not the most important thing. You just need to talk about Jesus. Everything else will kind of work its way out. Um, Like it's an optional topic for like a session in the afternoon, but we're going to do the core stuff right now, you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like, so I guess in either case, whether it's kind of this like benign neglect of the topic or Mm -hmm. this direct, no, 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 that's a scary or dangerous thing. um, Could you just speak to like, how why this is so important for parents who are especially who are christians to be bringing the conversation of um racial distinctions ethnic differences diversity Mm -hmm. uh and even the, the harder stuff like the whether it's you know george floyd's death or the recent shooting in buffalo new york or we could sadly i mean just list so many different instances um what would what would you say to parents who are kind of scared about bringing mm. up those topics for all of those different reasons. Oh, wow. Yes, we could, <laughs> we could probably spend a couple hours trying to unpack all those things. Let's see if I can give you a couple of um, summary statements in response. Okay, so this word fear, it comes up a lot, right, mm. when we are talking about this topic. And what I've been trying to, even from my, in my own mind, um, work out and then communicate to others is that when I... What I see in scripture is that God does not give us a spirit of fear. He gives us a spirit of power and love and truth. So I have to believe that when we are experiencing fear in talking about this issue, you know, that's not from God. And I do believe that is one of Satan's huge weapons that he is using right now in the church to prevent there from being either conversation or progress in the area of uh, racial reconciliation. So, so what are we potentially afraid of? Are we afraid of ostracization with our peers? Are we afraid of judgment from other Christians? Are we afraid of getting it wrong? We are going to get it wrong. So we can just like normalize that. You know, even I as a person of color feel like I stumble along, say the wrong things, um, make the wrong, have the wrong assumptions. So just for one thing, let's just normalize that that's going to be a reality. When you start talking about this, of course, you're going to make mistakes because none of us have perfect understanding of you know every other ethnic and racial background um, here in this country and on this planet. So so let's try to not be afraid of that because, again, the spirit of fear does not come from, from Christ. Um, as a, When it comes to, okay, there's fear because we might get judged from other Christians, I kind of feel like you might. Um, and that may be actually evidence that you are on the right path. <laughs> you know, if, if you are getting pushback, if you're having to struggle because now your friends and family are upset at you or just think you're, you know, out to lunch and you're going on some liberal pathway, really ultimately, you know, God is your judge. And as you sit before the Lord and ask him, it, are you the one giving me these kind of revelations and these convictions? Like, where is that coming from, Lord? I think you'll find that he'll be convincing you and reassuring you that, yes, you are 
you are moving along a path that truly is about you know opening my gospel you, you mentioned the word gospel opening the gospel up to the world because I think the church has been missing the boat on the opportunity we have to be able to reflect to our broader culture uh, that we have the answer. The answer when it comes to issues of race and racism is Jesus. And this is what the secular culture lacks. This is where the conversation outside of the Christian faith will be destined to be incomplete. Mm. There is no way that the culture can come up with a solution to racism because they're not able to name what racism is, which is an outgrowth of sin, of mm -hmm. course, and the brokenness of our world. And there's no way that a, a non-Christian can fully be able to provide the solution, which is Christ and the way that Christ can bind all wounds and bring the kind of healing that can restore the nations. That's not going to come from any human effort. It's only going to come from Christ. And so the more that we can, as Christians, understand some of those just basic, I think they're kind of biblical theological truths that we try to articulate as clearly as we could in the book to give parents kind of that foundation so they could trust that as they have these conversations, it's not just coming out of some secular wind. It's coming from scripture. I mean, these directives and these uh, principles um, and the theology undergirding all of this this whole conversation it comes from God and we just celebrated Pentecost I know this won't be uh, published until later on but as the church recently celebrated yeah. Pentecost which my goodness I mean you're talking about a, a clear as day example of how God uses the gift of ethnicity and ethnic identity to further his mission. I mean, Pentecost is an amazing story of that. And thousands and thousands of people became Christians as they heard their own heart languages coming from the mouths of people who didn't even know how to speak those languages to begin with. So you know, God is using this very particular component of ethnic heritage and identity to further the gospel. So it's true that culture, ethnicity, these are not the gospel, but God uses them to further the gospel. They are part of God's message to reach the nations, to bring the world to a reconciling knowledge of him. So it's well, and it does seem. Yeah. Oh, it, go ahead. Well, I'm just, it also seems to me that the story of scripture is one of like particularity and diversity, right? That you have mm -hmm. this chosen nation of Israel always mm -hmm. meant to be a light to the nations. Yeah. So there's that. And yeah. then once that starts to be even more lived out through the church in the sense of we're reconciling Jew and Gentile, it's not mm -hmm. so that they can become the same in their ethnicity, right. even in the outward manifestations of that in terms of food practices or Sabbath keeping or circumcision, mm -hmm. right? But actually mm -hmm. so that they can become unified in this um, relationship, reconciled relationship with God, mm -hmm. but retain diverse languages and cultural practices and in fact celebrate that so that... Yeah. You know, we get this sense of that's harder and it's more true. It's like more of a reflection of who God is because of the diversity that re remains. Like there's mm -hmm. more of a sense of God's own, um, yeah, like abundant and uh, multifaceted being when we are able to not just acknowledge our common humanity or for Christians, a common identity in Christ, mm -hmm. but actually also say that's what allows us to celebrate these diverse expressions of that humanity is actually there's like a commonality mm -hmm. and a diversity. And I feel like sometimes we like fall on one side of that or the mm -hmm. other rather than than holding that together. And that seems pretty central to me in terms of what the gospel of like the good news of Jesus mm -hmm. coming to say, I'm here to like, yeah, to mm -hmm. love, to heal, to redeem. And yeah. that's not to make everyone the same. Um, but it, it is actually to allow us to not be threatened by each other, to open up all sorts of possibilities for receiving one another and seeing each other's, yeah, distinctions, again, not as yeah. threatening, but as actually gifts to each other. Absolutely. And I think that sometimes parents forget the fact that, I mean, demographically, this is a reality here in the United States, and especially more so for our kids. So it's not like a future reality that America is going to become a non-white non nation in like 20 years or so. It's actually a reality now. For those who are 18 and under, that 
population is already Mm -hmm. very multi-ethnic, very diverse, and majority non-white. So our kids are already seeing this. Depending, of course, where you live, it it changes as to how much they're seeing it, Mm -hmm. but they will continue to see it more and more. And as, as they grow and head to college, they'll see it even more and more. I mean, this is a reality for our kids. So the more we resist talking about it and engaging the conversation, the less prepared they will be for the reality that they are actually already in right now. So our kids, depending, of course, on um, their their age, can articulate this more than others, depending on how old they are, but they are noticing, even babies notice racial differences. I mean, this is like a scientifically proven fact. And so if, if babies are noticing and toddlers are seeing, but no one is helping to give them language to again, normalize talking about it, then then they adopt whatever is in the water they're swimming in. And that can be a very dangerous thing, depending on what that water is telling them. So the more that we can take initiative as parents to be willing to try to push against the fear we might have about talking about this, um, pushing against the concern that we may not know all the answers about this and I may get it wrong. It's all right. Yes, you may and you will, as we all do. But um, it's more important that you start and make mistakes than don't start at all. Amen to that. I'm also thinking about when this um, podcast episode is released, It's we're going to be kind of coming up along what to many Americans um, – especially white Americans, is a mm. new holiday. Like, right, mm. we're coming up on Juneteenth, which is a, a now mm. nationally recognized yeah. holiday, which is a celebration. And it's um, I've been struck in my own parenting that it's really important for me to, as we've talked about, name the injustices of our present and our past and the ways in which race has played into injustice. Mm. But it's also really important to honor the beauty of diversity and to celebrate mm-hmm. the ways in which, whether that's a historical event like Juneteenth mm-hmm. or the history of different cultural expressions within American culture have like shaped and formed us. Anyway, I'm thinking about Juneteenth just because of the time of year, but I'm wondering yeah. if you have advice for parents um, who are seeking to explain, to know what it means mm. to like observe Juneteenth. If you're not a black American, like mm-hmm. what are we doing as a nation? How do we do this? How, how have you done that with your own kids or what advice would you give to parents? Yeah, I think whenever you're facing um, any kind of cultural holiday, marker, experience, um, where you're not entirely sure what the best thing to do is, then we we want to reach out and learn from those who do know, right? So just uh, there's nothing wrong with just even observing and, and seeing and looking with your kids at the ways that your Black friends are celebrating, going on social media to even see how some of your Black friends are communicating about it and um, and learning from them is super important. I'm Actually, this is not going to be easy in a podcast, but there's a book that's coming out by Darina Williamson on Juneteenth for children. I'm trying to see what date that is. So this is not <laughs> ideal on a podcast for me to be looking um, at my phone. But in any case, I know Darina has written a children's book. So Darina Williamson oh. is a, an author who writes children's books. She's written the book Colorful, um, graceful, um, the celebration place for IVP, yeah, just some, just a small number of the books. And I think her book with Juneteenth is also with IVP, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. So anyway, looking for books and resources for children, of course, super, super helpful. I, I always find I'm biased. I think books are great, <laughs> especially <laughs> children's. Yeah. Especially children's books, right. Um, are a wonderful way to, to just read with your kids and learn alongside your kids. Because again, you know, we as adults are, are also learning and growing as well. We are, usually the issue is not that there's not resources out there. There's usually plenty, whether it's a book, whether it's a video, whether it's, you know, YouTube, whether it's a television series. Um, There is, there's so much out there. It's usually just more about initiative and intentionality. So I think if Christian parents just are willing to take that intentional time to look and see what's out there that would be age appropriate for their kids and their families, do some learning on their own as well, do a little reading up beforehand. Those are things that are anyone can do. I mean, there's nothing hard about it. It really just is a matter of will and willingness to take the time to to prepare and to learn. Well, thank you. And um, I'm curious, I mean, this is, you know, just kind of coming to the end of our time and we, as I said, you've got 10 postures in the book, and not only do you have 10 postures, but then at the end of each chapter, there are a list of, you know, a, a good handful of different mm-hmm. practices and activities, um, many, many resources, just like you just answered as far as books um, and other ways for parents to be in conversation with their kids. Um, I took away just even the um, 
watching the news together and then discussing Mm. it at uh, the dinner table, just having various, I mean, little things that can be incorporated into family life. But I'm curious if there are one or two practices that you as a family have um, really come to value when it comes to becoming race wise. Uh, One or two things that you would just leave us with as far as things that have been helpful for you as a parent. Yeah, I think, and this it's going to sound so basic. I, I wish there was... <laughs> basic is okay. Sometimes that's all we can handle. Yeah, we, um, as a family, during, especially this was during the pandemic, we actually spent um, most of our Sundays, you know, worshiping at home like many people did, but we actually did our own scriptural study mm-hmm. um, as a family. And then, of course, ended every single time of study with just open prayer. And there... Prayer is such a great way, I think, that we can not just communicate with God, which, of course, is the primary purpose of prayer, but it's also a way that our kids can learn from us as parents as to how we engage with God on Mm -hmm. some of these challenging topics. So as as you are praying out of the sincerity of your your own heart, lamenting things you're seeing on the news, naming some of the injustices and realities where you need and want to invite God's justice to reign, um, expressing um, those moments of lament, expressing solidarity with those who are suffering. I mean, as parents, I, I think that's incredibly powerful for our kids to hear us being willing to verbalize those cries of our heart and soul in this particular area and, and being able to acknowledge, you know, God, I, I don't know what to do about this. Like, I don't know what to do about this continuing injustice that's happening against black and brown bodies or naming those realities, like just being able to do that so that your, your kids can see the sincerity of your own journey. I think that is incredibly, incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. So really the process of becoming a race wise family starts with parents being willing. And we've used that word intentionality already, but just being willing Mm -hmm. to take that time to open up their own hearts, minds and souls, because it's not going to always be comfortable. It may actually be painful at points as you start kind of confronting maybe areas of your own bias or areas of your own ignorance or areas where you know you need to repent of certain things, or you have to own and name your own privilege, as you mentioned. That's a posture we talk about in the book as well. So this is not a comfortable journey yeah. <laughs> at times. It's not. Um But what's on the other side of that is the more we can open up our hearts and our minds and our souls to the realities around us, the more we can open up our eyes to see the injustices and be willing to name it and talk about it, um, the more our kids will begin to see the water more clearly, you know, around them. And that's, I think, super, super important, especially if you're someone who is, you're a family that's growing up in the dominant culture. I mean, the world is changing. And so that water is going to change and continue to change in the future. The more you can be aware of it, talking about it, naming it, normalizing conversations around it, normalizing it in your prayer time, the more your kids will start to pick up on that and learn from that as well about how to be race wise themselves. Mm. Helen, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for your book. Thank you for your stories. I really appreciate it. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thanks for having me on, Amy Julia. Thanks, as always, for listening to this episode of Love is Stronger Than Fear. You can check out the show notes for more information and be on the lookout for one more episode this season. Next time, I will be talking here with theologian John Swinton about health and disability and healing. I've already recorded that conversation, so I can tell you that you will not want to miss it. I was so blessed by that. As always, I'm grateful to Jake Hansen for editing this podcast, to Amber Beery, my social media coordinator, and I'm thankful to you for being here. So as you go into your day today, I hope and pray that you will carry with you the peace that comes from believing that love is stronger than fear. Mm-hmm.